Thank you, uh, Andy, very much. Uh, the whole day has brought uh, a thought to mind to me. Uh, probably, I, maybe there'd be one or two others in the room that would count as I do. Uh, Hubert Humphrey among my heroes. I had one opportunity to be with him and he taught the whole time. It was just a magnificent moment in my life. But he, he said this, he said, the greatest gift of life is friendship and I have received it. Uh, I brought, uh, had many of my friends and then I got to meet uh, Richard, Rob and I had not known, but others are just clearly friends of many years and I cannot thank you all enough. And uh, I, I can tell you working with everybody in the center is a sheer delight with Andy, with Carl and uh, Christy. Oh, there's Christy. I thought maybe she was off. She's hurting, she's hurting cats all the time and we're all cats and she does a marvelous job and keeps us all smiling. And Christy, thank you for all you've done. Uh, my talk is entitled uh, Flickering Lights on the Hill. You might put a question mark after that. Uh, the Constitution and Public Engagement by Churches and Religious Leaders. Uh, Ralph Ketchum, uh, the primary academic biographer of James Madison, said that Madison, the father of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, reflected that, quote, there is no principle in all of Madison's wide range of private opinions and long public career to which he held with greater vigor and tenacity than religious liberty. End quote, and at a time of religious persecution in Virginia, Madison wrote to his dear friend William Bradford, so I leave you to pity me and pray for liberty and conscience to revive among us. Uh, this has been an exquisite conference, an effort to bring people together. Uh, I, I'm concerned about the state of the world, and I fear that means I'm getting old. But in 2012, Pew uh, did a study that found that the number of Americans who do not identify with any religion continues to grow. One f at a rapid pace, they add. One fifth of the US public was in that category. And a rapid growth, a growth of 33% at that from 2007 to 2012. From 2012 to 2015, it grew another 23%. And, it, uh, and so now uh, about a quarter of the population doesn't affiliate with any religion. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that religion is going to be mistreated. But there is a matter of concern and uh, President Holland raised it, and it's particularly among the youth where 35% consider themselves unaffiliated and that is growing, and that's twice as large as baby boomers. And who would have ever thought of the baby boomer generation as this big religious generation? But it, it, there is a change afoot. Again, that doesn't bother me terribly. What bothers me is that Pew reports that 67% of this rapidly growing group believe that, quote, churches are too involved with politics, end quote. Concerns regarding religious liberty are, in some sectors, being marginalized. Martin Castro, chairman of the United States Commission on Civil Rights, and I think Robin referenced this earlier, believes that concerns regarding religious liberty are simply code words for discrimination, intolerance, racism, homophobia, or any form of intolerance, end quote. And Frank Bruni from the New York Times says, faith is a serious matter and an important one, but it's trivialized when it's uh, toted too readily and stridently into the political arena. These are his words. 
God should be given a rest, end quote. Uh, churches and religious leaders have long been engaged in the political arena as advocates for moral positions, as political candidates and office holders, and as supporters of given candidates. Public engagement and voices of religious conscience have been critically important in the four most prominent constitutional moments in our nation's history. The founding, the Civil War, and end of slavery, women's suffrage, and the Civil Rights Movement. During the founding era, religious leaders, as in every era, were on both sides of the issue, or all sides of the issues. Witherspoon, John Witherspoon, is the person I want to focus on in the founding era. Reverend Witherspoon was a Presbyterian pastor and a public servant. A month before he was elected to the Continental Congress in 1776, Witherspoon gave a sermon that was influential as a moral defense of the revolution. And his uh, sermon was entitled, The Dominion of Providence Over the Passions of Men. As a member of the Continental Congress, Witherspoon signed the Declaration of Independence. He later served as a delegate to the New Jersey Ratifying Convention. He was a political figure of some moment. All the time while he served, he continued to give his Sunday sermons and to serve as president of the College of New Jersey, which we now know of, known, is known as Princeton. Overshadowing Witherspoon's public service was his service as a teacher. Professor Gordon Wood referred to Witherspoon as, quote, the most influential teacher in American history. His classroom teaching and his Sunday sermons influenced Witherspoon's students, which included a president, a vice president, nine cabinet officers, 21 senators, 39 members of Congress, three justices of the Supreme Court, 12 state governors, and numerous members of state ratifying conventions. Most noteworthy among his pupils was James Madison. In fact, after graduating from the College of New Jersey and still wondering what he should do with his life, Madison went back to the College of New Jersey and was tutored for another number of months by Reverend Witherspoon. In his lectures on moral theory, Witherspoon taught Madison and that influential generation of students that were his, quote, that the principles of duty and obligation must be drawn from the nature of man. That is to say, if we can discover how his maker formed him or for what he intended him, that certainly is what he ought to be. He understood that central to who we are is a notion of finding ourselves. Madison later referred to it as sacred property, as one of our students, Danny, indicated earlier today. For him, it was something central. And it wasn't just license and doing what one wanted to do. It was a sense of duty to God. And I th think that um, Doug really, I, I felt, hit a home run. And, lunch on this sense that this is so central to how some people define themselves and we need to respect them and I, my wife is here my wife Danielle and there's nothing more challenging than being a parent and sometimes sorry Mary my uh, eldest daughter who's sitting by her mother sometimes their behavior was completely irrational as far as I was concerned. It was something I just needed to straighten out. But Danielle said, it's real to them, Rod. That's where we begin. It is real. Madison understood how real this sense of duty was. 
And so he endeavored to protect it in the First Amendment. Incidentally, Madison would never have made it to the First Congress had it not been for the electioneering of those good Baptist ministers who sought to have him elected because he stood for religious liberty. Well, the same was true of the Civil War. Lincoln referred to Owen, Reverend Owen Lovejoy, as, quote, his most generous friend, end quote. Interestingly, it was Lovejoy, among others, particularly Thaddeus Stevens, who assisted Lincoln in, first in, well, actually he assisted him in forming the Republican Party in Illinois and later worked with Thaddeus Stevens on emancipation. Uh, Lincoln was also influenced by his family, uh, Pastor Phineas Gurley. On July 17, 1862, a group of 17 Pre Presbyterian ministers met with Lincoln at the White House. They were urging him to free the slaves, to issue an Emancipation Proclamation. At the end of that meeting, Matt, uh, Lincoln said, feeling deeply my responsibility to my country and that God to whom we all owe allegiance, he said to the ministers, I assure you I will try to do my best, and so may God help me. Just days later, on September 13, 1862, Lincoln noted that he'd been ruminating over the issue of the Emancipation Proclamation. He reflected in particular, quote, I'm approached with the most opposite opinions and advice, and that by religious men who are equally certain they represent the divine will. And I love how he then concluded, I hope it will not be irreverent for me to say that if it is probable that God would reveal his will to others on a point so connected with my duty, it might be supposed he would reveal it directly to me, for unless I am deceived in myself, as I often am, it is my earnest desire to know the will of providence in this matter, and if I can learn what it is, I will do it. Just days later, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation. What were the final words? I invoke the judgment of mankind on this act and the gracious favor of Almighty God. He was influenced by pastors, by religious voices, and made a decision of enormous moment. Suffrage is the same issue. Susan B. Anthony's primary biographer said, uh, Susan B. Anthony's Quaker faith absolutely shaped her. Susan B. Anthony learned that men and women ought to be equal as part of her Quaker faith. And her attendance at Quaker meetings where women had an equal place at the table. Suffrage in Utah also as in many other states, illustrates the role of churches, religious advocacy in bringing the vote to women. Wyoming Territory was the first to give women the vote in 1869, quickly followed by the Utah Territory in 1870, and Washington Territory in 1883. But Utah held the first election, so Sarah Young, a niece of Brigham Young, was the first woman to vote legally in the United States. Emmeline Wells, the fifth G General Relief Society president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, was friends with Susan B. Anthony and a proponent of rights for women. Voices of religious conscience clearly influenced the suffragist movement. Although I love these, this caution from Susan B. Anthony, she said she distrusted those people who know so well what God wants them to do because I notice it always coincides with their own desires. 
Now, the fourth moment, and that's the civil rights movement and Dr. Martin Luther King. He did as much, in my estimation, to ensure civil rights and racial equity as any single individual. He had a unique capacity to bring attention to injustice through his sermons. He, uh, he became, and, and, and Nick Coates, a respected biographer, chronicles the interaction between King and Lyndon Baines Johnson, President Johnson, and concluded that it was an unlikely but powerful team effort. So King was involved in politics. I have a wonderful quote, and if anybody wants the longer paper, I'm happy to share it with them, of, of, of a conversation between Johnson and King that was clearly political. Well, Dr. King became the leader of the boycott and the black church. At the, uh, uh, this was 1955. Ms. Parks had refer, refused to give up her seat early in the boycott after assuming the responsibility of being the spokesperson. A rock or brick came through King's window, Dr. King's window, and on it was a note saying, threatening him and his family. He had a baby upstairs. He was shaken to the bone. In his words, he went into the kitchen, drew a cup of coffee, and wondered, what should you do, Martin? And he decided for the interests of his family at this period of time in his life, he would withdraw from the movement. He went upstairs to take his daughter in his arms and comfort her that she might know he, did not, he was not going to threaten her life. But in his words, in the moment, he took her in his arms. He knew he needed to do it for her. That's conscience. And did he ever? So I won't elaborate further. There's more in the paper, but public engagement by churches and religious leaders. I, I, want, the, I want my grandchildren to know it's been a good thing. It's not been a bad thing. They've not always been right, but grandpa's not always right. And I think it's a voice that we need to take care that we do not disincentivize its role in the public square. Now, there isn't a problem, in my view, with the first, uh, first amendment. They're not going to be able to prohibit churches from being involved or pastors from speaking. In fact, they can do all of that. They can electioneer if they want. They can run for office if they want. That's all legal in the United States. Uh, but what is happening is the use of a strong disincentive. Churches, as we learned earlier, again from Danny, they, they, are, they need an exemption for their property. And then they get deductions from gifts like other charities from their members. They, this charitable deduction helps fuel, as Danny said, the good they do. But for other reasons, in the 50s, Lyndon Johnson again created an act, the Johnson Act. And it prohibits electioneering by churches and their leaders. It has been wholly ineffective. Uh, in a recent article in The Atlantic, we learned roughly 9% of people who had attended religious services during the election period heard, heard clergy speak out in favor of a political candidate, and roughly 11% heard clergy speak out in opposition. 
What's remarkable, they say, though, is that it's apparently happening at one particular kind of church, those run by black Protestants. The progeny, if you will, of Dr. King. Fully 28% of those who attended Protestant churches heard their pastor support Hillary Clinton. 7% experienced the opposite. They're opposing Clinton. On the whole, black pa pastors were overwhelmingly and articulately from their pulpits <coughs> opposing another candidate, Donald Trump. I, the, the, uh, they've even gone, now on the right, they've gone so far as to create a pulpit Freedom Sunday when they all engage in civil disobedience and disobey the Johnson Act. So it's largely ineffectual and not terribly troublesome to me. I mean, the one problem is that perhaps people will commandeer it and turn it into a pack. Well, if that happens, that slippery slope, let's deal with it when it happens. There's fraud and so forth. There are other ways to deal with that. I think the problem is that opponents of religious, of engagement and religious speech in the public sector and expression are going after an even bigger fish. Not just the charitable deduction for churches, but they've found a way to go after largely the churches they don't like, the voices they want purged. Mark Oppenheimer writes the beliefs column for the New York Times said, the logic of gay marriage rights could lead to a re-examination of conservative churches tax exemptions, conservative churches tax exemptions. Although as long as the IRS is afraid of challenging Scientology's exemption, everyone else is probably safe. But when that day comes, it will be long overdue. I can see keeping some exemptions, hospitals, and he goes on through a list, but not conservative churches. And so, how is that to be done? Well, through anti-discrimination laws. They tend to be the more pro-traditional marriage, they which can be viewed, as we've heard articulately today, with good reason in some measure as discrimination against the LBG, LGBTQ commu community. And abortion views can be viewed as discriminatory against women. And the use of that discrimination tool has uh, precedential roots. The Bob Jones case. In Bob Jones University, they would not, a Christian university, and it seems the Christian world is as broad as the world of Islam. It was a Christian university, didn't believe in interracial dating and mingling. And the result, the IRS took away their tax exempt status for their property, for deductions, and in the process had, had a real impact. Now, most people, that's not troublesome because that's race and we all agree on that. But that same device is out there and can be used. Uh, while we didn't compare notes, uh, the uh, President Holland again referred to Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., and I believe his descent in Abrams, and I think there's wisdom here. He said that every year, if not every day, we have to wager our salvation upon some prophecy based upon imperfect knowledge. While the experiment is part of our system, I think that we should be eternally vigilant against attempts to check the expression of opinions that we loathe and believe to be fraught with death unless they so imminently threaten immediate interference with the lawful and pressing purposes of law that an immediate check 
is required to save the country, end quote. And that's very consistent with Madison. In my view, using the powerful check of tax law to limit political expression engagements at a minimum regrettable. Uh, churches and their leaders are divided on issues. They speak from every corner. And they speak to conscience, and conscience motivates. And it's not a bad thing to have a motivated electorate. Now, I'd like for them to be, to have more of those yes, Robin, kumbaya mo moments where every, the sides get together. Uh, Let me close I did, so that I can say something that's sort of a new idea to throw out. And it's something I learned from Bernie Sanders. And to su it's, it, it, if I were telling a joke, I mean, it would be, what do Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump have in common? Well, part of what they had in common was they were able to get enormous energy from a broad range of people, especially in many instances on both sides, the poorer among us. They felt like they were getting a voice at the table. And so they sent in their $25 contributions. And tell me, and it's one of the things I, why I feel a heartfelt fondness for for Americans United is most of these donations are from small people who care deeply as a matter of conscience about these issues. So I suggest let's give them a non-refundable exemption. Let's encourage their expression. Let's not discourage these voices of conscience in the public square. Let's find ways to invite all to the table. And in closing, and this wasn't in the paper, may we do it in the way this conference has done it, bringing a variety of viewpoints together, seeking the truth, respecting one another. And with that, out of respect for my friend Pat Shea, I turn podium over to you.